Okay, the next item of business is portfolio questions. The portfolio on this occasion is net zero in energy and transport. As ever, members wishing to ask a supplementary question should press the request to speak buttons during the relevant questions. And I call question number one, Jamie Hawkins johnson To ask the Scottish Government how it is informing tourists and other visitors of how to use the roads across the Highlands and Islands safely. Cabinet Secretary Fiona Hislop. In 2019, Road Safety Scotland, Police Scotland and the British Vehicle Rental and Leasing Association developed a campaign targeting those not familiar with driving on the left. Leaflets, wristbands, windscreen stickers were provided to car rental companies to distribute to foreign drivers, hiring vehicles at airports across Scotland. We also offer advice to motorcyclists as well as drivers of caravans and motorhomes. In 2023, post-COVID, the campaign was relaunched and resources were made available in tourist centres, airports, ferry ports and supported by variable message signs. The driver wristbands say drive on the left in nine languages and reservoir, reservoir gators uh, saying ride on the left in eight languages were produced for motorcyclists. A short animation video for drivers to view in advance of picking up their vehicles was also created. Orders for materials are being distributed for this year. Jimmy Hawker Johnson. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. The potential risks when tourists and others unfamiliar with uh, the road use the A9 are well known. But across the Highlands and Islands, we're seeing a proliferation of motorhomes, many driven by people with no experience of driving one before, nor of the difficult and too often pothole-ridden roads they're driving on. And in Orkney and Shetland, there has been an increase in visitors touring the islands on e-bikes provided by the cruise ship. They've just come off. Many won't have ridden one before, and they're using roads simply not suitable for large, slow-moving groups of uh, cyclists who can often be more focused on the scenery rather than the road and other traffic. It's something I've seen myself. So can I ask the Cabinet Secretary what concerns she has of the potential risks these situations are creating and how the Scottish Government can support the police and local councils in addressing them? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, the member raises a, a very important and serious uh, uh, issue in relation to unfamiliarity, uh, different vehicles. I think uh, motorhomes that are being hired should also then be identified, I think, as a, a particular target for the campaign I've referred to. And his point about e-bikes and ferries, ferries as well as airports are very important you know, exit points for destinations. So whopping the, the profile of these issues and the, the Drive on the Left campaign is really important there. I'm also aware um, of some uh, flights particularly uh, Logan Air or others, sorry, I may be correcting the, the, the airline concerned, actually announcing that to those that are leaving from their, um, their craft as well, as well. So raising that profile is, 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 continues to happen. And we also do support through road safety um, councils such as Highland Council. Thank you. Question two, Katie Clark. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to reports that it has spent nearly £6 million on consultants providing advice on the future of the ferries. Uh, on complex high value projects, specialist advice is required to ensure that Scottish Government contracts fully meet uh, policy objectives and legal requirements, and these figures refer to work since 2015. This has included support from specialist technical, legal and financial external advisors, including those with expertise in the maritime sector through their work both in Scotland and internationally. This will help ensure we adhere to the relevant legislation, that we meet the needs of communities and that the appropriate ferries projects deliver value for money to the public purse. Katie Clark. I understand that the latest award is of a quarter of a million pounds to Ernst & Young, but passengers and the workforce are in the dark as to what this work by consultants has achieved to date. Will the Cabinet Secretary advise on this and commit to a formal and regular structure of direct engagement with the RMT, TSSA and other CalMAC unions over the case for a direct award? And will she outline the engagement she is having with islanders and what more can be done to ensure that the voices of the workforce and islanders are heard in decisions about the future structure of our ferry services? Cabinet Secretary. The short answer is um, I do, they are, and we will. Uh, we regularly uh, engage with uh, unions. I have a specific regular session with ferry, uh, ferry unions in particular, and obviously the direct award has been uh, subject to discussions uh, with me, with them, but probably as important, if not more important, the detail of that and the, the content for the next award um, has been the subject of direct engagement by Transport Scotland officials um, and the unions. Uh, similarly with Islanders, indeed we'll be reporting on the consultation to, with Islanders for the next award. So uh, the answer is yes, we do, and uh, yes, we will continue to do that. 
A number of supplementaries. I'll try to get them all in, but they will need to be brief, as will the responses. First, Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm pleased to see the new MV Lochindal being launched at the weekend and look forward to entering service next year. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree that we could make more progress and deliver more investment in essential infrastructure like our ferry fleet if Scotland's capital budget had not been slashed by the Tories? And I should share my concern if Labour wins the election, far from providing more funds for Scotland, there will be further cuts that will hamper our ambition for ferries and other essential Cabinet Secretary. infrastructure. So we have delivered record levels of funding for ferry services and improved infrastructure in recent years, and it was great to see the Lock and Doll uh, launch uh, just at the weekend. We've clearly got planned investment as set out in the island's connectivity plan and the vessels and ports plans, uh, but it does rely on significant uplifts in budgets, particularly in relation to capital. We know the UK spring budget fell far short of what Scotland's uh, needs are. We know from the IFS that Labour are planning uh, cuts and would require cuts of up to £20 billion by 2028. So what we really need is the UK incoming government to bring forward an emergency budget to restore the £1.3 billion cut in Scotland's capital budget. Uh, briefly, Paul Sweeney. Well, sir, would the Minister agree to allow for a private, if necessary, briefing by First Marine International on the benchmarking study they carried out into Ferguson Marine Shipyard and the investment needed to make it sufficiently competitive? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I'm not responsible for Ferguson Marine, but I will relay that question to the Economy Secretary, who has the key responsibility. And briefly, Beatrice Wishart. Could the Cabinet Secretary indicate whether the Scottish Government has hired consultants to look at the option of tunnels to replace ferries, and if so, how much has been spent on this to date? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, tunnels are part of the SPR2, and she will be aware that the uh, Shetland uh, Task Force in particular are looking at different uh, connectivity issues across the islands, including obviously their own council ferry replacements, but also on tunnels. And they have had constructive engagement um, with the task force, the, the Shetland uh, Ferry Task Force, that's uh, convened by the uh, Cabinet Secretary for Finance, and I think in terms of looking at that, the consultants' work that's been done, carried out by Shetland, we've agreed to look at in terms of any business development support that might be required in terms of planning. But that maybe is a, a broader answer to the specific question she asked. Question three, Carol Mochen. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what assessment it has made of any economic and social impact of there being no rail service between Ayr, Girvan and Stranraer since the line was closed in September 23. Cabinet Secretary. I'm very much aware of the impact of the closure of Air Station and that what it's, the impact it's had to people who live, work and travel to from Air, Maybole, Girvan and Stranraer. Um, as the member might be aware, the lead responsibility for Air Station Hotel rests with South Asia Council, uh, whilst Network Rail has the responsibility for the rail station itself. Um, we share concerns regarding the length of time the works to secure the building of taken. It's a complex nature of safety-related works, which is an invest investigative work developed, required the southern extension and a large portion of the northern extension to be demolished. However, I am pleased at the latest advice from ScotRail that bus replacement services are operating well, and from the 17th of June, they expect that an air to Glasgow electric service will be reinstated. I also understand that it is hoped that a full return to services, including to Mabel, Girvan, Barhills and will be possible from mid-July. Carol Mochen. Thank you for that answer. I too welcome the news that we can expect services to resume in July. However, businesses and commuters in those towns and the surrounding areas have suffered as a result of this disruption. A big problem has been the lack of affordable and actually the reliable bus routes to pick up the strain when these events occur. Since 20 uh, over 1,200 bus routes have been lost in Scotland and in the real terms the cost of bus travel has increased. A recent report by the IPPR Scotland called Wheels of Change have called the Scottish Government to identify, fund and champion the anchor towns and communities which would provide public services and transport hubs for people living rurally. Can I ask the Cabinet Se Secretary what action has been taken in this regard? Cabinet Secretary. Um, so I, I recognise that uh, the fire that caused the disruption it was not responsibility 
of anybody but those that caused that fire. And the consequences of that are being met by a whole load of different um, organisations. Her point about and segueing into how you can help have, I suppose, anchor towns in terms of that uh, public sector transport modal shift, I think um, is an interesting segue from rails, but I, 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 I get it. Uh, and in terms of the work that we are doing, that is a main focus of what we're trying to do with our transport strategy to ensure that we can help support um, modal hubs for buses and trains. We have a deregulated bus system. This government brought in the 2019 Transport Act and the subsequent legislation to allow choices for regional transport partnerships to take different positions. But as she knows, because she'll be aware that her own party did not make any changes to that deregulated position when they, when they were last in power, that that also means that there has to be partnership working with private bus companies who are responsible for the vast majority of these Thank services. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. I'm going to call a brief supplementary, Sharon Dowie. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I also welcome the news that some rail services will return to Air Station from the 17th of June, with services south to Mabel, Govan and Stranard expected to be operational in July. The fire at Air Station Hotel has been devastating, severely impacting local businesses and the community. So, given that no service was in place for over nine months, what measures can the Scottish Government take to encourage passengers back onto the tracks and therefore um, visiting towns in the south west and boosting the local economy. Cabinet Secretary. I appreciate the member's point. It was also raised by, I think, um, uh, another member during First Minister's questions. Uh, clearly, we have currently a discounted uh, proposition with the removal of peak fares, which is to encourage uh, people um, to use rail more generally. But I do think she makes an important point that we need to help in terms of the publici publicising and promoting the services to encourage more people to visit the south west. Question four, Claire Hawkey. To ask the Scottish Government how it works with local authorities to promote road safety. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, we are supporting our commitment to make uh, Scotland's roads safe for all with a record £36 million investment in road safety in 2024-25 to reduce casualties and risks on our roads. This includes the Road Safety Improvement Fund, which each local authority can access to improve road safety on their networks. The Scottish Government collaborates with all local authorities via our local partnership forums, part of the Road Safety Framework to 2030's governance structure and various other road safety forums. And those forums give us the capability of improving communication between local and national level and Road Safety Scotland has developed a full suite of learning resources for 13, uh, sorry, for 3 to 18 year olds which are available on their website. Claire Hawkey. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. I frequently hear from constituents concerned about speeding across my Rutherglen constituency, including on Brownside Road and Cambus Lang, which has seen numerous accidents over the years. More often than not, however, South Lanarkshire Council don't commit to implementing traffic calming measures. Of course, prioritising areas for traffic calming is an operational matter for South Lanarkshire Council themselves. But can the Cabinet Secretary outline further how the Government engages with local authorities to ensure that they are doing what they can to improve road safety for pedestrians and other drivers? Cabinet Secretary. So, in terms of our road safety uh, framework to 2030, we aim to protect our vulnerable road users and to achieve safer road travel in Scotland. As I said in my initial answer, we engage our local authorities through the local partnership forums and other road safety groups. And through the Road Safety Improvement Fund, we do provide financial support as well as road collision data to allow local authorities to deliver evidence-led uh, road safety initiatives to target over-represented uh, mode and users within their respective areas. And also we're providing financial support for local authorities to deliver the 20 miles per hour speed limits as part of the national strategy. Thank you. Brief supplementary. Foisal Chowdhury. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. In May, I joined Living Streets in the UK charity for active travel and encouraging children to walk through Walk to School Week. Uh, however, our roads are seen as too dangerous for many, with casualties on the roads increasing since 2020. Can the Cabinet Secretary outline what measures the Scottish Government is taking to increase road safety to promote active travel and assure me that projects for Transport Scotland's road safety framework will be fully funded until 2030? Cabinet Secretary. So road safety is a big concern of mine. It's why we've also got that record level of funding in the road safety um, and road improvement budget. Um, and in terms of his question, he's really referring, I think, to local roads. I'm responsible for trunk roads, 
the council will be responsible for local roads. But his point about active travel also incorporating safety measures is one that's well made. And I'll make sure that in terms of taking forward our active travel plans, that road safety is embedded as part and parcel of what we deliver. Thank you. Question five, Brian Whittle. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on its commitment to increase the number of electric vehicle charging points, particularly in rural areas. Government Secretary. The Scottish Government has invested over £65 million in public EV charging since 2011. As a result of this and increasing private investment, Scotland has the best provision of public EV charging per head of any part of the UK except London and the most rapid charge points of any part of the UK. We now have over 5,000 public EV charge points and are on target to hit 6,000 by 2026. We are investing a further £30 million through our EV uh, infrastructure fund, supporting local authorities to leverage private investment to continue to grow public EV charging in Scotland, with funding specifically prioritising those areas of Scotland that are less likely to attract private investment in public charge points, including rural and island communities. And earlier this month, two EV infrastructure fund grants were issued to support continued growth of the public EV charging network across a number of local authority areas in Scotland. Scotland and further grants are due to be issued over the course of 2024. Brian Whittle. Yeah, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. I think the ability to use uh, an electric vehicle depends very much on the ability to access uh, charging points. And these charging points are more likely to be found in urban areas. To support our uh, rural households, would the Scottish Government consider off-grid wind or solar power charging points in rural areas to avoid uh, over, uh, um, overburdening the grid? Uh, that's an interesting point. I'm, uh, I'll ask my officials to look at what might be more self-sustaining um, uh, in terms of uh, provision of charging points and obviously that's something that in terms of the rollout of charging points all over Scotland, big geographical area, um, any innovative ideas as how we might do that as we have seen recently with BT using um, the green infrastructure furniture on our, our streets is another innovative, innovative way of helping improve that range of charging points. Brief supplementary, Colette Stevenson. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, clearly, local authorities have a key role alongside the private sector to continue to grow the EV charging network, especially in the many rural areas in Scotland that might otherwise struggle to attract commercial investment. Can the Cabinet Secretary advise what the Scottish Government is doing to support councils to play their part? So we have a clear partnership with local authorities. We provide that EV charging infrastructure fund I've just referred to in my first answer. Um, this year, it's expected that Scotland it will benefit from up to £50 million in private sector investment, public EV charging, and our £30 million uh, EV infrastructure fund encourages local authorities to collaborate to develop the scale of opportunity that can attract that commercial investment. And that's really important to help um, develop uh, the provision right across the country and also to support the skills, expertise and resources that will be needed in that area. But local authorities are key partners in this. And briefly, Alec Rowley. Thank you, President Officer. A few months ago, I visited Maui and Rusai and saw they were installing quite a number of EV chargers. They explained to me that they intended to continue that process and hopefully open it up to the public. So my question would be, does the government see employers as having a key role here? And if so, are you speaking to employer organisations, particularly in rural Scotland? Cabinet Secretary. I think that's a point well made. Uh, the range and extent and therefore the confidence of people to use EVs will be on the dependability of uh, the charging network. And bearing in mind if people are still using cars to travel or work to work, we want to encourage them to use public transport. But clearly, particularly in more rural um, areas, uh, employers that can provide charging for their employees is very, very important. But they uh, too will be part of this uh, programme that we have, working private and public together to have that extended reach. But it's a point well made. Question six, Emma Roddick. To ask the Scottish Government how it envisages that the recommendations of the second Strategic Transport Projects Review will benefit the people of the Highlands and Islands. 
Cabinet Secretary. Uh, this government is committed to de developing and maintaining a safe, resilient and sustainable transport network to connect our communities. SBR2 includes 37 recommendations out of a total 45 to improve connectivity for the people of the Highlands and Islands. We are already investing in our ports and vessels, on our CHIFs and NIFs networks, enhancing active travel connections and improving the A83 in conjunction with other SBR2 recommendations, including an integrated transport plan for Fort William. These measures will collectively improve reliability, accessibility and travel choice for the Highlands and Islands. Emma Roddick. I uh, thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Uh, fast, easy train journeys can play a huge part in getting people and freight off the roads. Can she speak to the potential for rail infrastructure improvements across my region, the Highlands and Islands, particularly the Highland Main Line, given its potential to reduce traffic and freight on the A9, where heavy loads can cause frustration and slower journeys? Cabinet Secretary. So phase one of the Highland Main Line improvement project was delivered back in 2012 and that increased services from 9 to 11 trains. Uh, the main phase two part of that was completed in March 2019 at a cost of £57 million. That had upgrades at Aviemore and put Lockery stations for signalling, along with the extension of the passing loop at Aviemore and the reconfiguration and extension of platforms at Put Lockery, enabling simultaneous arrival of trains at both these stations. And there are currently no active enhancement projects on the uh, Highland, Highland Main Line. However, officials at Transport Scotland continue to revise its programmes of works again priorities in the context of available funding. Thank you. Question 7. Marie McNair. Or 20 miles per hour speed limits. Uh, Ms McNair, I, there was something wrong with your audio. Could I ask you to repeat the question, please? Apologies, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the progress in implementing the national strategy for 20 miles per hour speed limits. Thank you. Cabinet Secretary. So the Scottish Government remains committed to implementing the 20 miles per hour speed limits on appropriate roads by the end of 2025, and we are making good progress towards meeting that timeline. All councils have now submitted their assessment of which roads would be appropriate in their area for a speed limit of 20 miles per hour. A delivery subgroup that consists of officials from Transport Scotland, local authorities and wider road safety partners will oversee the implementation of that scheme nationally and will produce a detailed programme of delivery to meet the 2025 deadline containing the actual costs to complete this important road safety initiative. Highland Council are currently successfully piloting speed reductions with communities which do not yet have 20 miles per hour speed limits also expressing interest in them. Marie McNair. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for the answer. I have been undertaking a road safety survey in Eastern Bartonshire, part of my constituency. A common theme arising from the data has been the safety of cyclists on our roads. In part, this will be due to the tragic death of a cyclist in Bearsden North earlier in the year. Can the Cabinet Secretary advise what work the Scottish Government has done to encourage safe cycling and to promote greater respect for cyclists on our roads? Cabinet Secretary. As part of our active travel behaviour change programme, we provided grant funding to Cycling Scotland to run a number of cycle safety training pro projects. That includes bikeability, cycling training for adults, and cycle awareness training for professional drivers, including HGV drivers. We also provide funding to Cycling Scotland to run the Give Me Give. Uh, me Cycle Space advertising campaign, which raises awareness for the need of people in cars to behave appropriately when sharing the road with cyclists. And Give Me Cycle Space continues to have a positive impact on driver behaviour, with nine in ten drivers reporting taking positive action, including leaving at least 1.5 metres of space when overtaking as a result of the campaign. Thank you. And a brief supplementary from Mark Roskell. Thank you. The picture across Wales is now absolutely clear that 20 mile an hour national rollout has reduced casualties by a third. But while the Tories seem to care very little about road safety, proposing a bill that would roll back on 20 mile an hour limits, can the Cabinet Secretary confirm that there is no such rollback in Scotland, the funding will be there for councils to implement their plans in next year, and that as part of that, a national communications plan will also be rolled out, learning from the Welsh experience of a 20 mile an hour national rollout. 
Um, we will follow the, uh, with interest the, the Welsh experience and indeed the three-month figures on the road casualties. I think it's worth reminding everybody that you, uh, if, you are hit, if you hit someone at 30 miles per hour, they're seven times more likely to die than at 20 miles per hour. So this is about road safety. Uh, we have to do it in a way that suits Scotland. We have got the plans in from local councils and the communication of that will need to be part of it. And uh, I, I can reassure Mark Ruskell that I am absolutely committed to ensuring that our roads are safe. And I do see 20 miles per hour limits as part of that, uh, that safety campaign. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Question 8 has uh, not been lodged. Therefore, that concludes portfolio question questions on net zero and energy and transport. Uh, there will be a brief pause before we move to the next item of business to allow front benches to change.